Okay, welcome back to uh, our last lesson in the chapter of functions. And uh, for this one, we're going to start talking about inverses of functions. So but before we kind of get started, I have like a little fun game we can play uh, as our warm up. So the warm up is, you know, basically think of a number, um, step number one, which I guess I could have wrote in there, step number one. Go ahead and think of any number, any number. Let's just keep it simple. Let's pick a number between, you know, one and nine. Uh, then what you're going to do is double that number. Then once you've doubled the number, I want you to add six to that number. Then what I'd like you to do is divide that number by half and then subtract your original number. Now, what number did you get? And if I wanted to create a nice little video and guess your number and then try to maybe, um, you know, surprise you, I'd say your number is three. And if you did all the math right, you're gonna get three. Um, and I'll show you, I'll pick, you know, just a number, but then I'll also use kind of algebra to kind of see, you know, the, why that works. And um, so basically every single time we're gonna do this, no matter what number you picked, one through nine, you're gonna get three. So let's just kind of do one little example here with seven. Um, so if I pick the number seven, all right, so that's step number one. Step number two is I'm going to double that. So therefore, seven times two is going to be 14. Step number three is going to be add six, which would be 20. And then step number four is I'm going to divide 20 by half, so that's gonna be 10. And then step number five is going to be subtract uh, your original amount, which is subtracting seven, which would be going back to three. And the reason why this works, if you actually kind of think about it, you know, doubling and dividing by half is really the same, oper or, sorry, they're what we call inverse operations. They undo each other. And adding six, but then go ahead and uh, double it, add six. Yeah, and add six and then dividing it by a half. Because if you think of it, like if you think of your number, that's like adding your number. And then if you subtract your number, that's like subtracting it away. So really the only thing that has not been undone is it taking the number six and then dividing it by uh, two. So let's look at this another way. Let's just look at this with a variable. Let's present, you know, it's gonna be the variable uh, x for any number. It doesn't have to be between one and nine. If you take the variable x and then double it, you would now have two x. Okay, um, then if we go ahead and add six to it, it would look like this, two x plus six. Then if we divide that by half, then we'd have two x plus six divided by two. And then if we subtract our original amount, what am I doing, one, two, I like wrote in the wrong steps. I like updoed it. So this would be three, this would be four. I hate my fours. Okay, so then step number five is going to be two x plus six divided by two minus x, right? And that's like subtracting your original number. And if you go ahead and simplify this, what we'll kind of, what we'll notice here is two divides into the two x and to the six, so therefore we're left with uh, x plus three minus x which again just goes and simplifies down to three. So you might have seen some of these online and people are like, oh, I can guess your number or you know, pick what else. Um, this is exactly what they're doing. Now, if they're picking, if they're actually picking a random number that you chose, all we have to do is just kind of make a little bit of adjustments to this. Rather than subtracting uh, your original number, what we do is we would just go ahead and subtract three. So instead of subtracting your original number, if I just subtracted three in this case, then you'd get X, which would be your original number. So therefore I can guess what number you're thinking about at any time. And again, the power of all of this comes into applying operations and then undoing the operations. And that's really what the inverse function is because we've talked about functions, you know, in this whole chapter, as far as you have an input value and then you have a rule that means basically operations are being applied you know to that um, to that input value to get an output so the inverse function is basically taking that output undoing the rule to take us back to our original input value which a lot of times we call the identity element so just kind of give you um, you know a formal definition of inverse functions uh, we talk about one-to-one, -one, and basically what one-to-one -one means is it passes the horizontal lining test. So, for instance, um, a quadratic is not one-to-one -one because each y, like for two and negative two, they both share the value of four. So, 
a quadratic is not one to one. So for a inverse, for a function to have an inverse that's also a function, your original function has to be one to one. So an example of that would just be like the identity function. Like every x value maps to uniquely a y, a unique y value. That's basically the idea of one to one. Um, our notation looks like this. It's called f inverse of x. Kind of looks like it's the f raised to the negative one. It's not really the negative one power. That is just our notation, and that represents the inverse function. Um, something else we'll get to later on is proving inverse functions. That is, you know, basically a way for us to be able to show that two functions are inverses of each other. Rather than following the steps that we're going to do, we're going to want to use compositions, and it's a um, conditional statement if and only if if you can compose a function and its inverse both ways that you can prove that a function and our two functions are inverses of one another probably one of the more important ideas though that we are going to come across from this or I want you to kind of take away uh, from this lesson is the idea of domain and range of uh, functions and their inverse because you know, we've spent so much time looking at the domain and range of a function, and um, the domain is rather kind of straightforward, I mean, as far as what we've done, but the range is, gets a little bit more difficult, and up to this point, we really only focused on finding the range for, you know, looking at the graphical uh, sense, and for a lot of problems, especially when you have access to graphing, you know, that, you know, kind of makes sense, um, and it works. But for when we don't have access to, you know, a graphing calculator or, you um, then a lot of times that what we're going to want to do, we can easily find the domain and range of a function by identifying the inverse because the domain of the function is the range of its inverse and the range of a function is the domain of its inverse. So what that means is if I want to find the range of a function, all I got to do is find the domain of its inverse, right? So we find the inverse of the function, then find the domain of that, and that's the range of our original function. And it sounds like I said a lot of things over once, and that's because I did. But I don't want you to get too caught up on it. We'll cover a lot of this stuff, you know, as I kind of work through the lesson. Um, but before we get into that, before uh, I think I'm actually going to get to, yeah, let's kind of talk about graphing the uh, graphing the inverse function and or graphing the the inverse of a function. So what I did is I provide kind of two, uh, three graphs here. The first graph is just showing your graph f of x. The next graph is showing actually what the inverse looks like. And then the third graph is actually showing them together on the same graph. And basically what I'm just kind of looking for you to see is like what relationships do you see between a function and its inverse, right? So you can look at, you know, when they're on the same coordinate grid, like what relationships are you doing? And I kind of give you a little help as well. I say, you know, it might be helpful to compare the points uh, to the inverse, such as 2, 0, and 6, comma 2. So, um, so of our function, I meant to kind of say uh, on the function, yeah, to the inverse. So let's look at this point 2, comma 0. So let me zoom in here. So here's the point 2, comma 0. Yeah. Okay, so that's two comma zero. And then let's also find the point six comma two. So six, two. Okay, now um, what we wanna do is a couple things. If we think about like, all right, so this graph from the function to the inverse function, let's see if I can undo that, there we go. This function from the function to the inverse function go, went from here to here. Right? Um, so what exactly, like, what changes can we say kind of, like, happened, um, you know, with those points? Like, here, this point has now gone transformed over to this point. So what can we kind of say um, as far as, you know, what is the coordinates of this new point? So these points are basically the same. They're the same, like, here's the function, here's the inverse function. And if you were to graph this coordinate point, that is 0, comma, 2. So it's basically the same as this one, but it just looks like the x and the y are swapped. Let's go ahead and find 6, 2, this point over here. Well, if I swap the variables, I go over to up 6, which looks like I just did it right off the graph. But you can see again that the x and the y values are swapped, right? And it looks like that is going to kind of take form for all the coordinate points that we have here, that each and every time that I have a point here, whatever x and y coordinates, they're going to be swapped. And if you kind of make the connection with the domain and range, that makes sense. The domain of a function is a set of all x values, where the range is the set of all y values. Well, if we're saying the domain and ranges are swapped for a function and its inverse, then it makes sense because 
the x values of the function are now the y values of the inverse function. And the y values of the function are now the x values of the inverse function. The other kind of really important thing to understand here is besides the x, the coordinate points being swapped, you can see that there's some symmetry. And previously we've only talked about symmetry as far as being along the x-axis, or I'm sorry, the y-axis and the origin. And you can see here these are symmetrical and I'm really bad at drawing lines like this. But you can see that these graphs are symmetrical about this line, right? This nice little diagonal line. And this diagonal line actually um, has a form. This is the identity line at y equals x. So you can see a function is symmetric. Function and its inverse are symmetrical about the uh, about the y equals x line. So that's going to help us as we kind of get right into example number one. Uh, which I'll get into right now. We'll just kind of get into it. So given the graph of a function, sketch the inverse function. So a couple quick things I like to do is um, I want to kind of see, like, maybe let's kind of pick some points that are kind of common here. So I see this point is at 0, 1. That means I know the inverse function. Let me use, like, blue. So the inverse function now is if this is at 0, 1, then the inverse function is going to be at 1, 0. Right? So allow at least to have a point that I know it's going to need to go through. Um, then what I'll do is I'll just kind of take this diagonal line, which is the y equals x, and I'll just kind of sketch it. And it doesn't need to be perfect. Okay, but what I notice is that this, this line, you know, intersects right here. Well, that's where my inverse function is also going to intersect, because, like, if you reflect a point that's on the line of reflection, it's going to be remain the same. So, therefore, if this is going to be my f of x, which I probably should have labeled there, then my inverse f of x is going to be going through those two points. So just kind of going back to our, um, you know, understanding as far as like making sure you have like two points, you know, to you know sketch a line or a graph. It, you know, it's usually beneficial um, to at least get the idea. And the more points that you can kind of sketch, you know, really kind of the better. Uh, for part B here. Same kind of idea. Now this one, the points don't really look as you know great, but I think I can kind of like estimate here. I don't know what this function is, but it looks like these points are crossing at these at the, those points there. Um, so if I kind of draw a line here, all right, those points are symmetrical there. Okay, so maybe I should probably find some more points that will help us out. So let's go and pick the point, I don't know, let's say, you know, it's at one and a half and, you know, four, or one and a quarter and four. So therefore, I'm going to be at four and, you know, roughly at uh, one and a quarter will be my new inverse point. Those points are now reflected about the uh, y equals x line. And this point, I'll do at like negative one and a quarter and then at four. So therefore, I'll do a four and I'll do negative one and a quarter. Okay. So now what I'm going to try to do is sketch this graph as best I can going through these two points and then also these two points. So I'll try to do my best here with this. And it looked maybe something like that, right? Roughly, I'm trying to do my best. But you can see here, at least on my horrible drawing skills, that they have some symmetry, right? So it's very helpful just by looking at graphs um, of function and another function, you should be able to determine if they are um, if they are inverses of one another. And then also, hopefully, this visual representation gives you an idea of why the domain and the ranges are swapped as far as looking at the x and the y. And what we're going to do now is we're going to move on to the algebraic process. So you can see how swapping the x and the y variables is going to uh, help us out with that. So we'll get into that next.